Thank you very much, uh, Cathy, for the introduction. So uh, thank you very, mu very much also for giving me the opportunity to talk today about my postdoctoral work. Uh, I'm working at COS at the Center of Organismal Studies, University of Heidelberg. And today I will talk about how cell signaling control of genome stability um, uh, occur during early lineage specification and during neurogenesis. Uh, maybe, I do you know, Cathy, how I, can I remove the upper part of the zoom bar? Uh, 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 yes, I didn't envisage it, sorry. Yeah, I'm not, I will right. just... do that. Everything looks fine on the screen. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, then I will continue, it's just maybe for myself. So, so sorry uh, for the interruption. So, um, genomic uh, stability is critical for proper embryonic development. Uh, however, the rates of the novel genomic mosaicism, uh, that is, uh, for example, mutations, copy number variations, or gains or loss of uh, chromosomes, that is an euploidy, are uh, not equally distributed neither across lineages nor across uh, stages of, of mammalian development. For instance, we have a huge uh, wave of aneuploidy or uh, chromosomal mosaicism in pre, uh, pre and post implantation uh, early stages uh, of uh, embryo development, as well as also uh, during uh, neurogenesis, where roughly 30% uh, of neural progenitor cells become aneuploid. And the causes uh, of, of this phenomena are, are poorly understood and have profound implications, given that aneuploidy has, for example, a direct correlation with the risk of miscarriage at early uh, weeks of, of, of pregnancy, and also um, an euploid in the brain uh, leads to neurodegenerative diseases. So these uh, developmental bottlenecks that we see here uh, may us think that perhaps there is a sulfate dependent context uh, that control chromosome, uh, uh, chromosomal mosaicism. And uh, cell fate and uh, lineage specification is uh, well known to be uh, directed or orchestrated by um, cell signaling and morphogens. So we, in turn, uh, question whether perhaps morphogens could be directly impacting chromosomal stability in the cells. And to prove this, we took uh, our in vitro models that are pluripotent stem cells, so naive mouse pluripotent stem cells and prime human pluripotent stem cells, uh, which are a good, uh, uh, a great uh, in vitro model uh, resembling the uh, first window of, um, of uh, chromosomal mosaicism that I explained before. And uh, here, what we did uh, was simply to, um, to um, uh, apply in the cell culture of, of these cells uh, different types of morphogens that have critical functions in early uh, development, but uh, we analyzed in turn what impact they had in chromosome missegregation. And with chromosome missegregation, I mean how uh, during anaphase the chromosomes segregate and whether we can find a lagging chromosome, for example, the one in the picture here, which is a, a sign of chromosome missegregation and potentially of an euploidy. So we perform a signaling screening, and by analyzing roughly around 18,000 18, anaphases uh, upon different perturbations, we found really interesting data. So we found that uh, in basal conditions, uh, in untreated uh, cells, uh, here I will depict the human pluripotent stem cells, and here the mouse embryonic stem cells, we found that these cells have roughly 5% of uh, probability to missegregate a chromosome during mitosis in basal normal conditions. Many of the morphogens that we tested actually uh, do not have uh, any impact. However, we found that uh, there were some signaling cascades directly inducing chromosome segregation. For example, basal inhibition of endogenous wind signaling through antagonist uh, DKK1 or through the inhibit inhibitor of uh, porcupine uh, secretion protein was uh, directly inducing uh, double or uh, double amount of probability to misegregate chromosomes. Also, many members of the FGF uh, ligand family uh, seem to have a conserved role uh, in, in, in this aspect and were also triggering high levels of uh, chromosome instability, as well as endogenous uh, inhibition of BMP signaling through, for, uh, no, through Noggin or Gremlin. So this for us was puzzling because we are not, uh, basically, we are not using an inhibitor of a checkpoint uh, protein of the cell cycle uh, to induce chromosome instability. We are using actually morphogens that are actually orchestrating and directing uh, embryo patterning and development. And why these morphogens will have a negative impact 
at least some of them, uh, uh, in, in this aspect. No? So that was an interesting question we want to, to, to answer. Also, it didn't escape to our mind that uh, many of these signals actually uh, that were leading to chromosome segregation were uh, crit are critical uh, to, uh, to establish the epiblast anteriorization during gastr gastrulation. That is, for instance, DKK1 or left TA. While the signals that are promoting uh, posteriorization at the primitive streak, such as Win3A, BMP4, or active in A, were uh, triggering really low levels of chromosome misaggregation. So it seems, uh, at least, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, this is in human pluripotent stem cells. I'm not working, uh, I'm not talking about the embryo itself, but it seems that there, there could be uh, not only a gradient of morphogens uh, in the embryo to to pattern uh, in the anterior posterior axis the embryo itself, but also perhaps a, 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 a gradient that controls uh, chromosomal stability. So we wanted to go uh, further and, and understand what are the epistatic uh, correlations between the signal pathways that trigger chromosome segregation in pluripotent stem cells. So we, we found that, uh, for example, when we inhibit uh, the uh, wind signaling with the endogenous, in, uh, with endogenous antagonist um, DKK1, uh, chromosome segregation occurs, and this can be uh, rescued by Win3A, the agonist of the pathway. However, cannot be rescued uh, by applying BMP4, meaning that BMP cannot rescue wind inhibitory uh, effects on chromosome segregation. On the other hand, while uh, BMP, as expected, was rescuing the effects of, uh, caused by the uh, BMP antagonist Noggin, also Win3A was able to rescue uh, the effects, pointing that wind uh, signaling can rescue not only the effects in its own pathway, but also in the BMP signaling pathway. Digging a bit more in the potential mechanism, uh, we also found uh, that GSK3 kinase, which is actually very important in many process of, uh, of uh, cell fate commitment uh, in pluripotent stem cells, was actually having a critical role integrating uh, the response to chromosome misegregation in pluripotent stem cells. Given that inhibition of uh, GSK3 actually rescues the chromosome misegregation defects caused by either BKK1, FGF, or Noggin, which are the main uh, morphogens that I will talk about from now on. Um, I will not give. I will not continue more in towards the, the mechanism, which we found that uh, is not only happening at the mitotic or M phase one, as as one could imagine by by the phenotype, but it actually back into the beginning of S phase during the DNA replication. But in turn, I will, since the audience is probably more interested on uh, developmental biology, I would like to give a bit more insights on how we have found that morphogens control genome stability differently in line in different lineages. So before going uh, there, I, we also validate that indeed um, chromosome misegregation was indeed leading to an euploidy. So after just one round of division uh, of, of cells treated with either uh, uh, DKK, FGF, or Noggin, we found that um, there was also an enhancement of uh, an euploid number of cells uh, respect uh, untreated conditions, uh, proving that uh, chromosome misegregation also leads to an euploidy. And uh, coming back to the question I was uh, mentioning in the slide before, the, we had we had a great model to to, uh, to to answer this question, or at least to try to tackle it. So we were wondering, does signaling control of chromosome segregation fidelity underlie the chromosomal mosaicism in human embryonic lineages? So what happens beyond pluripotency? So we established based on already um, uh, validated protocols uh, in collaboration, uh, so uh, with the support of uh, the PhD student in our lab, Janina Hatemer, who did a really great job. We established uh, several protocols to, to obtain primitive streak, definitive endoderm, lateral and parexial mesoderm, neurectoderm, neural crest, and neural stem cell-like cells. And uh, here, uh, we were not so much... Uh, uh, I mean, we, we know that, uh, of course, morphogens and uh, cell signaling impact directly cell fate. But here we wanted to uh, ask or interrogate what is the effect of this uh, signaling in terms of genome stability in each lineage. So we focus, in, at least in this uh, slide, the attention in inhibition of basal wind signaling. So we basically treat, uh, um, so we establish a differentiation of pluripotent stem cells in towards uh, the three germ layers. And while we found, and this has been shown before, that pluripotent stem cells are actually uh, really sensitive to chromosome to, to, to DKK1 or to inhibition of basal wind signaling 
in, uh, and they increase a lot the levels of chromosome segregation in this presence, the uh, early lineages do not care about that. And uh, this response phase down. This response phase down, but re-emerges later on in, in development, or at least in in vitro uh, mimicking development, in neural progenitor cells, which are again very susceptible to the presence of DKK1. So uh, this uh, was uh, really interesting, uh, given that we could uncouple fate and chromosome stability roles caused by by cell signaling, and it didn't escape to our to our uh, attention that. Both pluripotent stem cells and neural progenitors are actually the in vitro counterparts of the hotspots of genomic uh, of chromosomal mosaicism that we have in uh, mammalian development. So we wanted to dig in a bit more on what's going on in neural progenitor cells. So neural progenitor cells are probably one of the lineages across development that have the higher rate of aneuploid. Uh, so uh, it is described that uh, in mouse development as a model uh, at E14.5, and there is uh, the, at the onset of uh, neurogenesis, roughly 35% of these cells become an euclid. And although most of them are actually um, eliminated by apoptosis, uh, it's known that both in mouse and human uh, adults, still we have roughly 2% of neurons that are an euploid, and around 40% of them showing copy number variations of more than one megabase. So this is showing a pervasive uh, chromosomal and genomic mosaicism in the brain, that is not really understood why uh, why is there. Um, there are more and more uh, recent papers pointing that there are high accumulation of double strand breaks and single strand breaks at the promoters of uh, long neural genes, and it it seems to have a, a correlation with with the evolution and the variation uh, of these cell types uh, in the brain. But we wanted to interrogate how cell signaling. Uh, could be impacting uh, this chromosomal instability in the brain. So we uh, focus, we took uh, the mouse uh, embryo as a model, and we uh, systematically analyzed different signal pathway activity across different stages of neurogenesis. So we found that while wind activity was um, quite uh, uh, similar across these embryonic stages in the subventricular zone of the brain, of the developing brain, uh, FGF signaling by means of the phosphorylation of the receptor, of FGF receptor 1 was peaking actually at E14.5 at the onset of neurogenesis, remember, when the cells are massively entering in uh, an euploid. So uh, by different experiments, a combination of experiments, uh, both uh, in vitro and in vivo, and also using live cell imaging, as I will show a bit later, we found that wind and FGF are playing a kind of attack of war or a signaling rheostat that controls chromosomal stability, in which FGF is triggering high levels of chromosome segregation and endogenous uh, wind ligands that are still uh, secreted in these cells are actually trying to buffer. It. And these results are, were providing for us uh, a rationale to, of the high levels of chromosome segregation that, that is in the brain. We also decided to go a bit more in vivo, and we've, uh, we basically, in collaboration with Juliet Alfonso, uh, Janina, my colleague, uh, injected uh, in utero uh, intraventricular uh, DKK1 uh, in the subventricular zone of the mouse brains, embryo brains, and we basically uh, section uh, these brains in, in search for uh, anaphases and to quantify chromosome segregation. And what we found was that uh, embryos that have been in presence of DKK1 for 16 hours have a double a chance to co uh, commit a mistake than uh, the control uh, embryos pointing the uh, importance of basal wind signaling in preserving or safeguarding genomic stability in the brain. And last, and with, with this I will uh, finish, uh, we also took advantage of light cell imaging uh, in order to answer what is the fate at the end of the neural progenitor that become an euploid, right? So we basically uh, track uh, the daughter cells after the mitosis in which the, uh, the lagging chromosome has been observed, we first of all obs uh, observe that indeed DKK1 and FGF are triggering high levels of chromosome segregation. This was expected. But what we were really uh, puzzled to see was that indeed in the in the in the mitosis where it has happened chromosome segregation, there is of course high uh, levels of uh, cell death, and this is of course expected because many cells cannot cope with this problem. But still, we have roughly 30% of the cells that will not divide anymore and assumably will presumably will uh, mature into mature neurons, proving or at least uh, indic indicating that there, there might be uh, an adaptation to chromosome segregation uh, in towards maturation of neural progenitors. 
So where are, uh, that I hope that it was clear, my, my talk, that take home messages that morphogenetic signals not only read our genetic blueprints, but also play a critical role in their maintenance. And where are we going now? So we are uh, establishing uh, uh, in, in vitro and in vivo models to recreate a bit better what can be the roles of morphogens in uh, embryo development. So we are working with uh, pre-implantation mouse embryos um, and post-implantation mass embryos. We are setting up this in the lab to try to understand in a more physiologically uh, relevant model how this uh, how morphogens are working in genome stability, as well as in uh, human gastroids uh, originated from human pluripotent stem cells with the support of um, the pioneer Alfonso Martinez Arias in, in this field. Um, and given that uh, this is also a nice uh, space to uh, promote myself. So I am, uh, as Cathy says, looking actively for a group leader position in which I would like to tackle, uh, I think a quite important question that is uh, how uh, basically uh, developmental resilience plays a role uh, in at the cellular level. No? So we want to understand how, uh, how resilience uh, or resilience to cellular stress uh, occurs uh, in different human lineages um, and not only from one type of stress, like for example, we have seen here with genotoxic stress, but from different types of uh, stress in the cell. And also how the cells adapt to this type of stress, no? like they are uh, activating and entering apoptosis, autophagy, or they are surviving and therefore changing completely. So that's what I am aim I'm, I'm aiming to understand in the, in the next years. And I would like to now give thanks to all uh, the laboratory, the special thanks to my uh, my mentor, uh, Sergio Pérez Acebron, Sergio Pérez Acebron, as well as a uh, special mention to Janina, who has done a tremendous work uh, supporting this project, to all the members of the lab, and also to the collaborators uh, here uh, at COS and also uh, abroad. And to all of you for listening. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Angel. That was really fascinating. So do we have any questions? If you could type those into the uh, Q&A box, then uh, we'll be able to answer them. And uh, while we're waiting for uh, for any questions, I, I just was interested in, in your initial screen, you showed various compounds that led to an increased rate of missegregation. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything which actually protects against missegregation or are the basal numbers too low to be able to see that? Uh, we we do actually. So let me maybe show you the the whole screening, uh, which is here. Um, I think I hope you can see. So we do see actually. Um, so the point is the le the rate levels of basally are not very high. So five percent is not really high. So we are basically quantifying here roughly two hundred anaphases per 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 dot per experiment. Let's say okay. Um, and but we do see that indeed wind, uh, wind three A, yes, K three inhibition, active in A or even BMP are actually a bit lower at a bit lower levels than uh, the untreated conditions, suggesting that these these uh, these factors are actually probably protective. However, the effects of protection we see them when we induce exogenously the genotoxic stress via morphogens or via um, inhibition of the of the of of, of the cell cycle. Right. And, and similarly, then, in your in vitro differentiated uh, neural progenitor cells, mm -hmm. do you see the, the higher endogenous rate of missegregation in that situation? So in vivo, you have increased in missegregation naturally in neural progenitors. Is that also replicated in your culture system? So in our culture system, um, so we have work in with two different systems. So we have worked with uh, IPS-derived uh, neural progenitor cells uh, from human, and also with ex vivo culture mouse neural progenitors at E13.5, uh, sorry, at E14.5, at the onset of neurogenesis. So we do see, um, so in the case of neural progenitor cells, we see, so the red levels that we see basally are not as high as the reported in previous publications. So I cannot quantify 30% of mytosis is going wrong, okay? That, if that's the question. Uh, so the rate levels is around 10, 15%. Uh, but we do, we, we, what we do see is a, a specific uh, effect of uh, basal inhibition of wind signaling or activation of FGF only at this stage and not uh, before or after. So um, I have here uh, maybe some data. So we have developed some uh, neural progenitor differentiation protocols. We have... Um, I don't show it here, but we have also uh, um, proved by gene expression analysis 
more or less the stages and only at the maturation stage, that is when the cells start to become really neurons, is when we do see a huge uh, effect of uh, either uh, inhibition of wind signaling or activation of FEF, not, not before. Yeah, I guess I was just interested in the extent to which these are intrinsic to the cell properties versus extrinsic environmental things that you'd only see in vi in vivo. And I think you have a nice system here to start to dissect that out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you, Kadi. Great. Thank you so much, then. Um, I'm not seeing any questions come into the... Into the oh, hang on, we have a question in there um, from... Uh, Ellen, who can't actually uh, use the Q&A, um, she said, uh, you've shown that the missegregation in induced by noggin is partly rescued by wind. Since BMP induces wind in gas relation, which she's going to talk about, could that mean that missegregation induced by the lack of BMP is at least partly due to the lack of wind? Well, that's a good point. So the epistatic uh, relation that we observe here between wind and BMP um, make us think that indeed that well, that on one hand, uh, if you lack uh, BMP, wind could take the task, at least uh, in terms of chromosome segregation. Perhaps, I'm not so sure, maybe I will listen in your talk uh, in the terms of fate. But what is clear is that in the other hand, BMP cannot take the, the role to, 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 to rescue um, lack of wind signaling. That's, that's, that's what we see. Yeah, 